Good evening. I'm Shelley Fisher Fishkin. I'm a professor of English and director of American Studies at Stanford. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you this evening on behalf of the English Department, Creative Writing Program, the American Studies Program, and the uh, Stanford Arts Institute. What a special treat to bring the Golden Gate back to the campus where it was born. We have a wonderful cast of Stegner Fellows and Stanford students whom you'll meet in a moment. And we are thrilled that Conrad Cummings, whose wonderfully imaginative musical vision set it all in motion, is here to share with us the magical alchemy by which he transformed a celebrated lyric novel into a lyric opera that has been named one of the best operas of the 21st century. Welcome all of you to uh, this evening's event. Uh, from lyric novel to lyric stage, I'm Vikram Sait. I was a student uh, here in the Department of Economics, in fact, and um, I don't think I'd have written this novel if it hadn't been for the fact that after a whole uh, late night of data entry, uh, I wandered into the Stanford bookstore and uh, chanced upon, um, because I thought there had to be some sort of life beyond data entry, um, I chanced upon two quite different translations of Pushkin's Eugene Onyegin, a wonderful novel in verse. Now, I'd never read a novel in verse before, and this so captured my imagination and fancy that I just decided to put my economics dissertation aside for a while and begin, uh, begin writing uh, what turned out to be The Golden Gate. So I'm delighted in, that uh, Conrad is uh, in the process of making this uh, book into uh, an opera. So with, without further ado, let me uh, welcome you to uh, From Lyric Novel to Lyric Stage um, and uh, say goodbye to you from afar. It's an honor to follow Vikram. How do you respect and love a great novel, in this case a novel in verse, and at the same time make it live and breathe on the lyric stage? To answer this question, we'll move between words seen on the page and spoken, and words sung and action seen on stage. For spoken words, our wonderful team of Stanford poets and readers, and for song, we'll have a video of a staged workshop of the opera that was presented at Lincoln Center. Let's start with the beginning. To make a start more swift than weighty, hail muse. Dear reader, once upon a time, say circa 1980, there lived a man. His name was John. Successful in his field, though only 26. Respected, lonely. One evening as he walked across Golden Gate Park, the ill-judged toss of a red frisbee almost brained him. He thought, if I died, who'd be sad? Who'd weep? Who'd gloat? Who would be glad? Would anybody? A novel begins with the turn of a page, a field of white and those first 14 lines. How does an opera begin? We learn some things before the first character even sings. These are a group of friends, not strangers. Four of them know each other very well. The music, you could say, is cocky, but there's also a touch of melancholy. address to the audience. The music and the other four characters do not take John's loneliness very seriously, even though John certainly does. I died, who'd 
Let's jump ahead now. John meets Liz through a personals ad, and the two are immediately smitten. A nighttime drive through the city brings our newly minted lovers to the tower on Telegraph Hill. The night is cold. It's late November. They stand close, shivering side by side, chilled by the ice cream. Yet an ember, a flare, ignited by the ride. This staring at the lights together defends them from inclement weather. They stand half shivering, half still, below the tower on Telegraph Hill, not speaking, with a finger tracing the unseen lines from star to star. Liz turns, they kiss, they kiss. They are caught in a panic of embracing. They cannot hold each other tight enough against the chill of night. It's late November. So this is clearly the place for the first big love duet. Uh, and this is where, in a traditional libretto, the two lovers would have a lot to say to each other, or to sing to each other. But they're silent. Not speaking, it even says. Will it work to have a love duet where the lovers simply describe their actions? This is a question I grappled with for a long time. And you see what you think. I want to let you in on a little trade secret. Uh, the texture of the music through the duet you're going to see is quite consistent. But there's a secret switch from five beats to six beats per measure when they finally kiss. That's what's behind the feeling of release and expansion that happens at that moment. See how it strikes you. Ideally, the effect is unconscious, but you know, sometimes it's fun to know what's going on. Not speaking with the fingers tracing me. Liz and John throw a housewarming party at their new San Francisco flat and invite Phil. There he meets uh, Liz's younger brother, Ed. Phil's too drunk to drive home to Palo Alto, so he crashes at Ed's apartment in the outer sunset. Phil's bleary eyes rest on a bowl of fruit, a crucifix, a roll of film, a photograph of Lana Turner, who smiles across the floor at Holbein sketch of Thomas More. <laughs> My patron saint. Which one? Ed grinning says go to sleep and turns to pray. He asks forgiveness for his sinning, gives thanks for the expended day, consigns his spirit to God's charity. Now Philip, with exiguous clarity and some bewilderment, sees Ed cross himself twice, then come to bed. Lights out. Taut, with a cataleptic tension, they lie, unspeaking. Phil thinks, why be so uptight? He's a great guy. 
I've never bothered with convention. God, it's been a year that I've been chased and puts his arm around Ed's waist. The tension is palpable, but this love duet is just as central to the action of the story as John and Liz's. What to do? Taught with a cataleptic tension. <laughs> I still feel things. Why be so uptight? He's a great guy. God, it's a year that I've been chased. Why God be so? It's a year uptight. No, he's a great I've been guy. Why God be so? It's a year uptight. Puts. He's a great I've been guy. His arm. Desperation led to invention, <laughs> along with the realization that everyone is wrapped up in everyone else's life in this piece and that there are a couple of words that were able to carry more than one meaning. Thank God Vikram loved the result. A waste. So uptight, he's a guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a waste that I'm chased by his arm around. God, it's so tight, it's that's a waste that I'm chased. And his arm touched his head good night. I did it fingers on God is waste, God is on God and I God is so and is so built. It's his arm, it's my waist, I mean chased on cross, it's his waist, it's so round, it's so great. So we're on to the second act now. It opens with a wedding, but uh, we're not exactly sure who's getting married. Guess what? It's Liz and Phil. John is shattered by Liz's rejection and feels betrayed by Phil. John and Jan reconnect in leisurely weekend days spent together. A canceled performance by Jan's band leaves her at home one night, and she invites John to dinner. She yells a cheerful, I'm just coming runs down the stairs, two at a time, hugs him, and with unconscious drumming, chisel on door, remarks, John, I'm sorry. I'm in the very middle of, it's that hen. She's such a riddle. Go, take a walk around the block and come back here at eight o'clock. John thinks, she hasn't changed much, really, in all these years. When he returns, they eat and talk and John's heart burns with an old longing. Is it merely night or her unchanged waywardness? And he says, Jan. And she says, yes. Yet tender as is their lovemaking, John gives his voice no leave to own what his hands touch, what his lips quaking, unknown perhaps to him, has shown more forthrightly than declaration. And if Jan's heart knows the elation it knew six years ago when they were lovers, she does not betray by open word for fear of sweeping a turbid patina of dust on the clean fabric of their trust, that as her heart was in his keeping once and the sharer of his pain and gladness, so it is again. It's beautiful. It's one of the most important moments in the whole story, and there's absolutely no way it can become a love duet as it stands. This is actually some of the very last music I composed for the opera, when my wonderful production team, and particularly director John Henry Davis, 
pointed out that there wasn't yet a full musical moment of love for these two characters. Times between sleep and wakefulness, half thoughts and half phrases can come and go. And it's at those moments that a couple in tune with each other can slip into lovemaking. So, fleeting fragments from these three stanzas, jumbled, half finished thoughts, are sung over music as steady as a lover's breathing during deep sleep. Now we're coming to the end of the opera. Jan dies tragically in a car accident. John is devastated, racked with remorse, and totally cut off from his friends. Sighing a harsh, prolonged, exhausted breath, John feels his heart revisit death. Depleted by his pain, he slowly walks to Jan's desk. What did not last in life has now possessed him wholly. Nothing can mitigate the past. He gently touches Jan's sand dollar. It soothes him in the ache, the squalor that is his life. And she seems near him once again. And he can hear her voice, can almost hear her saying, I'm with you, John. You're not alone. Trust me, my friend. There is the phone. It isn't me you are obeying. Pay what are your own heart's arrears. Now, clear your throat and dry these tears. And we say goodbye to John at that moment. End of novel. Will he struggle out of his isolation or remain frozen in it, maybe for the rest of his life? the ending of the opera has been a lesson for me in how different stage time is from novel time. Is it enough for John to hear Jan's voice as a disembodied presence and not react to it? Not on stage. Is it enough for John to be poised with his hand over the phone? Let me tell you, it did not work in the first of about 20 versions of the end of the opera that I wrote. <laughs> With the brilliant help of my production team, director John Henry Davis, conductor Stephen Osgood, and workshop producer Emma Lively, we came up with a very different order of final events, and even invented a new action to bring the opera to a dramatic close. <laughs> in other spots, Lines from 10 different places in the novel are rearranged to make this new flow. There's even text from the very beginning of the opera and the novel, now seen in a very different light. If I died, who'd be sad?
you see next is Vikram Sait reading the stanza, actually from much earlier in the novel, that becomes the opera's finale. We'll follow that by the finale of the opera. They wander for a while, not saying too much, then stroll out on the pier by Old Fort Point. Surfers, displaying sinuous equestrianism, steer their boards on the inpouring rollers. On shore, the eight-year-old controllers of motley skateboards swiftly skim in competition bright and trim past fishermen, gulls, rocks and breakers, while high above the Golden Gate, nestling the fort in unornate magnificence across the acres of white-capped sea, the golden span hangs for the world to him and scan. was how to maintain tension right up to the end. To do that, we created a situation where John is forced to make a decision, whether to remain in his rigid isolation or to take a first step toward human contact. enough to the spirit of the novel's ending? We felt so. See what you think. Oh.